Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. If you don't know, I'm Christy and this channel is all about deconstructing our former Christian beliefs. Today, I want to address the claim that Christianity is not a religion, but it is a relationship with God. I see it all the time in my comments, and I used to believe it myself when I was growing up in the Southern Baptist Church. I refused to acknowledge that I was in a religion at all, and I only ever presented it as this personal relationship with Jesus. And I think that this is a very clever way to make Christianity seem as though it is set apart. It is unique and different from all of the other religions in the world. It is an attempt to make it more accessible and warm and inviting, something people want to be a part of that isn't so rigid and full of rules and legalistic. But I don't think it's a very honest approach to presenting Christian theology. And I just don't think it's true. And so I'm going to give my thoughts today. I want to talk about Christianity as a religion, if, if it is a religion, if it's not by definition. I want to talk about Christianity as a relationship and what that means. And I want to compare Christianity to the relationships that we experience here on earth and what we see as healthy, unhealthy, and abusive. And let's see where Christianity falls within those categories. So I think the best way we can start this is by defining religion. What is religion? And let's see if Christianity falls within the definition. Religion is a system of beliefs and worship, often involving a code of ethics and a philosophy concerning the nature of the universe. So we have a system. It has beliefs. It has worship. It involves a code of ethics and philosophy concerning the nature of the universe. I think Christianity falls within all of that, <laughs> don't you? It's a system, yes. I mean, it is It is groups of people coming together with roles and responsibilities and working together to, uh, to for one common goal. A system of beliefs, well, belief is kind of the core of, of the whole Christian thing. You have to believe in Jesus to be saved, John 3, 16. Worship. Every Sunday, Christians go to church. They get together. They sing their worship hymns. They do their prayers. They talk about their beliefs. Um, I don't think that you can be in Christianity without worship. A code of ethics, Ten Commandments, anyone? The teachings of Jesus, anyone? A philosophy concerning the nature of the universe. I would say that Christians really love presenting this idea that that they know our meaning, our purpose, why we're here, where we came from, who created all of this. Um, that is a type of philosophy of the nature of the universe. So on every in every corner of this definition, Christianity applies. And so I don't think it's very honest when Christians say that it's not a religion, when by definition it falls under that umbrella. But I think what's happening here is they are redefining words like they do very often within Christian apologetics to make their worldview and their beliefs fit even when it doesn't. We see this a lot, These this redefining of words, this manipulation of language to make the worldview fit rather than recognizing that the worldview doesn't fit within the language that's being used. I think it would be a lot more honest if Christians admitted that they were a part of a religion, but they were also in a relationship with God. Two things can be true at once. They can say, yes, we're in a religion, but also this religion involves a relationship with God. So where I land is that, yes, Christianity is a religion, but I'm giving the Christian, uh, you know, that it can also be a relationship. So now that's what I want to explore. Christianity as a relationship. If you look up the definition of relationship, it's pretty broad. It just says the way in which two or more people or groups regard and behave toward one another. So when Christians say it is a relationship, they are uh, suggesting that there is this connection, this behavior and these actions that pass between them and God. And relationships can be varying levels of healthy and unhealthy. When you look up the National Domestic Violence Hotline website, they kind of have this outline of three different groups of re or categories of relationships. You have healthy relationships, you have unhealthy relationships, and you have abusive relationships. But I would imagine that when Christians are presenting this uh, this claim, 
that Christianity is a relationship, that they're not saying it's a bad relationship or an unhealthy relationship. No, they're they're suggesting that this is a joyful, happy, healthy relationship with God. There's all kinds of different ways to define a relationship, who's in it, and their connection to one another. The Bible, interestingly enough, provides two images for this relationship between God and humans. And I'm kind of creeped out. (laughs) I'm kind of creeped out by it. Because on one hand, you have this this imagery of a parent-child relationship. God is your father in heaven. You are his child. He created you. He is there to watch over you and protect you and take care of you. And you are to obey him. Then you have this this other imagery that is provided, uh, like in Ephesians 5, 22 through 25, where it says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And there are other verses throughout the Bible that presents this imagery of a bride and her bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride and he's coming back to to rescue us all. And though (laughs) different denominations will present Uh, the Trinity or the concept of God, Jesus, sometimes the Holy Spirit, they'll present them different ways. But, you know, within this kind of evangelical fundamentalist bubble, usually there is the Trinity, but they are three persons in one, right? So you have God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and then you have the Holy Spirit. And though they are three distinct kind of manifestations of God, they're all one God because Christianity is a self-proclaimed monotheistic religion. There is one God and he is both your father and your husband. I find that to be really, really icky, (laughs) weird, bizarre, strange. I don't know. All of the adjectives. Um, it's, It's very discomforting. Yet the Bible describes God as both the parent and the spouse, which is just really weird. And so let's just assume, let's 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 forget one for the other for a moment. And let's just assume that this is a parent-child relationship. Isn't a parent's job to nurture and protect, to love unconditionally their child? Yet with God, he has uh, kind of placed you here on this earth and he has put his sworn enemy, the most evil entity in all of the universe, Satan, here on earth with you. And he gets to roam around. He gets to get inside your mind and trick you and 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 drag you to hell. He has free reign <laughs> over this earth. We see it in Adam and Eve when the serpent is crawling through the garden, who is supposedly Satan, according to a lot of Christian denominations. And he's like whispering in their ear and he's tricking them. And then that leads to the the, the damnation of, of all of humanity or the condemnation of, of all of humanity. And then you see in Job, when God gives Satan permission to absolutely destroy Job's life and take everything he loves away from him, causing just an intense amount of suffering (laughs) in Job's life. And God gives Satan permission to do that. Imagine for a moment, if we're using this, this imagery of a parent and a child relationship, that your parent goes out into the world and and meets the town creep, brings him back over, gives him free reign around the house, lets him hang out with you, leaves you guys alone together, uh, lets him do whatever he wants, gives him permission to to treat you however he wants to treat you. And then if you were treated in such a way and if you are deceived or you are, uh, you know, convinced to do something wrong while you're alone with the town creep, um, the parent comes home and blames you for it and you get in trouble for it. When you really just kind of like flesh out this analogy that God is a parent, he's a really bad parent. He creates you. He creates you so that you can serve him and glorify him and obey him for no other reason than that. He expects your unwavering devotion no matter how he treats you. He condemns you to eternal hell if you don't obey him and love him and worship him and want to have a relationship with him. This is not the picture of a good parent. Then you take the imagery of of a bride and her groom, of spouses, and it's just as bad, if not worse. 
that you have this relationship with uh, your spouse who demands that you do everything they say, who is not your equal, but your authority, who expects your obedience, who expects your um, your constant praise and worship. And when you're standing there saying your vows to one another at the altar, they tell you that you must vow yourself to them. And if you don't, they're going to throw you in the burn pit in the backyard that they built just for you. <laughs> Actually, I'm sorry, they built it for the town creep, but you're going to go in there with the town creep too. It's it's not adding up when you take, you know, these these this imagery that they give us, they tell us God is your father. They tell us Jesus is your groom. But then when you actually compare that to how a relationship should look between a parent and a child or a, a spouse and another spouse, it doesn't line up. We're not we're not there's a there's a major disconnect. And I think that we would see these as very unhealthy relationships and even abusive relationships if we if 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 parents were to treat their children or spouses were to treat their spouses like God treats humans. And so no matter which way you go, it's just weird. It's weird to say that God is both your father and your spouse. It's weird to say that God is your parent, yet treats you like property, that he is your spouse, but he treats you like property. Um, I just think it's an unfair comparison. I don't think it's honest. Again, it's just a dishonest a presentation of the theology. And if it is true that God is your parent or God is your spouse, um, then it's very unhealthy and even abusive. And I want to kind of dive into that now. I want to look at, um, you know, like what I talked about before, the the National Abuse Hotline, their website, um, or the National Dom Domestic Violence Hotline, excuse me, um, their website that, that shows kind of this breakdown of healthy, unhealthy, and abusive relationships. This spectrum, it is a spectrum. It's not just three categories. It can kind of, you know, relationships can fall in the in-between. But I think that this is a really good uh, kind of compilation of, 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 or a picture of what these relationships would look like if they're healthy, unhealthy, and abusive. So in a healthy relationship, you and your partner are communicating. You're respectful, trusting, honest, equal, enjoying personal time away from each other, making mutual choices, and economic financial partners. In an unhealthy relationship, you're, you might not be communicating. You'll be disrespectful, not trusting, dishonest, trying to take control, only spending time together, pressured into activities, and being unequal economically. I think that's a pretty good picture of what an unhealthy relationship might look like. In an abusive relationship, you have communication that is hurtful or threatening. You have mistreatment, accusing the other of cheating when it's not true, denying their actions are abusive, controlling and isolating their partners from others. What I'd like to do is I'd like to kind of pick just a few things from each list and let's compare it to the, the God of the Bible and the relationship that he has and expects with humans. Let's start with healthy relationship. Uh, you have communicative you talk openly about problems and listen to one another. You respect each other's opinions. How often were you told that sometimes God gives an answer and sometimes he doesn't? Sometimes he responds and sometimes he's silent. That you have to remain faithful. You have to remain steadfast even when you don't hear from God, even when you don't feel God because he's testing you or he's doing whatever God does. You have to remain steadfast. If my husband suddenly stopped talking to me, he decided to get in the car and drive away and he was gone for three, four days, five days, a week, five weeks, and I just didn't hear from him. I don't think that would be a healthy relationship, do you? Yet when God does it, it's perfectly fine. I think about when I was really struggling with my faith and I was really trying to figure out what I believed and I would beg God, like beg in tears, please show me. And it would just be crickets. It would just be silence. Nothing would happen. I wouldn't hear anything. I would hope I would expect something to come up in my life within, you know, the next few days of the week that would really show me which way to go. And it didn't. I would pray and I'd say, God, I really just need guidance right now. You know, I'm going to open up my Bible. This is a trick a lot of Christians like to do. And I, I bet more Christians do it than are willing to admit that they do it. And my experience doing it is probably very common. 
with Christians, but they don't admit it. Um, and, and that's that I would I would pray and I'd say, I need a word. I need guidance. Please just just give me what I need right now. And I just open up the Bible randomly. <laughs> and It would take me to like, you know, somebody begat somebody begat somebody or like, you know, Ezekiel 23, 20, you know, there she lusted after her lovers. You know, there was like it was always something just that didn't apply whatsoever. Um, and it would just be silence on God's part. But yet Christians would tell me, you just got to stay faithful. You just got to wait. He'll show up eventually, but it's in his time when he chooses to do it. That is not communication. That's not a, a back and forth healthy communication between two people in a healthy relationship. Okay, what about respect? It says in a healthy relationship, you value each other's opinions, feelings, and needs. You have respect for one another. And yet, it seems as though God isn't really too concerned with humans' needs and their feelings and their opinions. That what you think and feel doesn't really matter, especially if it doesn't align with what God wants. I mean, how often have we as ex-Christians, you know, claimed that we just really don't like the way God treats people? We don't like the rules. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right to us. And they say it doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you think. It's it's what God thinks. It's what he wants. That's what you have to care about. Your feelings don't matter at all. In Romans 9, it says, But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? You can't you can't talk back. You can't disagree. You how you feel about something is completely irrelevant and unimportant when it comes to what God feels, what God desires, and what God wants. That's not equal respect. That's not a consideration of feelings, thoughts, and opinions. If I get to a point where I say, I really don't want to worship God. I don't think he's very nice. I don't think he's a very good God. I don't think he treated human beings very well. Um, That doesn't matter. So what? worship anyway. It's your duty. It's your job. Doesn't matter how you feel. That's not what people do in healthy relationships. You listen to one another. Even when you don't agree with one another, you listen. You try to understand why they're feeling the way they feel and you work with that. It says, uh, trusting in a healthy relationship, you believe what your partner has to say and don't feel the need to prove each other's trustworthiness. Well, God loves to test people all throughout the Bible. You know, we have Adam and Eve in the garden, He's testing them to see if they're going to eat the fruit or obey him. Abraham on a mountaintop, are you going to kill your son? Are you going to obey me? God is always testing us. My husband and I, we love and trust one another. We have this mutual trust and we don't feel the need to put each other through these weird manipulative tests to see if the other is going to prove themselves. Healthy relationship, you set boundaries. You enjoy spending time apart, alone or with others. You respect each other's need for time and space apart and you communicate with each other about what you aren't comfortable with. And I'm just curious, what boundaries are you allowed to place with God? I've learned uh, in my adult years that boundaries are so important. I did not believe that boundaries were something that I could have as as a person growing up as a child uh, with my parents, with adults, with God, with the church. Boundaries just weren't an option. Even w- and within the context of this this all knowing, all seeing deity, um, there is no option for boundaries. You don't get to tell God to just give you some space. You have to do everything for him all the time. You have to always have your thoughts on him, meditating on him, praying to him, seeking his will. There is no separation. Your entire life is to become what he wants and what he desires. And your thoughts are always to be on that. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. There's another verse that says, pray without ceasing. There is this just this belief that in every moment, every second, every aspect of your life, you are to be in this communion with God, seeking him and doing whatever he wants for his glory. He is inside your head. He is reading your thoughts. <laughs> he, he he knows everything about what's going on in there. And, and that, I remember as a Christian, was very, um, it, it freaked me out. And 
what it's funny because I felt like I wasn't allowed to be freaked out by that. You know, it's kind of going back to, um, to, to respect and respecting feelings. I did not like the idea that God could just be inside my head, listening to my thoughts that made me feel so uncomfortable, but it doesn't matter what I feel because it's what God does is what he wants. My feelings don't matter. I can't tell God, Hey, can you get out of my head, please? I don't get to do that because I have to do whatever he says. So we see that when you kind of like outline a healthy relationship and then you compare it to how your relationship is supposed to look like with God, the two just don't line up. And and, and I think that this just implies that this is a very unhealthy relationship that you're having with this deity. But let's kind of drive that point a little bit further and let's look at the characteristics of an unhealthy relationship disrespectful uh, and an unhealthy relationship you or your partner behave inconsiderately toward one another god drowned the entire world in a flood because he just wasn't happy with the way they turned out god is always dishing out these punishments these incredibly harsh punishments against the people that he supposedly loves for god so loved the world that he drowned it and he sent plagues to destroy it that one day he's going to rain fire on the earth and destroy everyone and 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 send them all to hell. That is incredibly disrespectful. <laughs> like in every sense of the word, that is disrespect. But do Christians even believe that they have earned God's respect, that they they should have respect from God? Because I, I don't think a lot of them do. I think that they they often believe that they are so bad, they are so depraved, they are so sinful that they just don't deserve God's respect. That God deserves their respect no matter how bad and mean and sinful he is, no matter how many lives he destroys, no matter how many people's lives he plays with or tests. Um, it doesn't matter because he's always respecting you just because that's just his nature. Whatever he does is respectful and whatever you do is disrespectful. Uh, taking control. In an unhealthy relationship, you or your partner suggest that one's desires and choices are more important than the others. I mean, God literally demands your submission to him. He commands it. It's, it's a requirement and a relationship with him that you must submit to his authority. He is in control of everything, in control of your entire life. There is a serious power imbalance here, and yet Christians kind of pose this as a a, a perfectly normal relationship, but you can't have a perfectly normal relationship when there is such a power imbalance. You will always be in submission. And when you are in submission to someone in such a, a an extreme way, I don't know how it is even possible for you to have a healthy relationship with them. But now let's kind of briefly discuss abusive relationship dynamics uh, and, and see how God compares to that. So in an abusive relationship, you are going to have a communication that is harmful. Your partner communicates in a way that is hurtful, threatening, insulting, or demeaning. When you are being told that you are just a depraved, dirty, disgusting, wretched sinner from birth, that you do not deserve love and respect and goodness, that you deserve to be eternally tormented in the pits of hell, but that God is just so nice and loving that he, he, he gives you all of that anyway. It's grace. You get what you don't deserve. That would never be considered healthy within what, what any of us know about relationships. If you were in a relationship with a spouse or with a parent and they constantly reminded you how bad, dirty, gross you were, how you didn't deserve love, how you deserve to be punished, you deserve to, to, to be harmed, um, I think that anyone who in your life would tell you to run, <laughs> run from this person, uh, cut ties and never talk to them again because they're hurting you. Yet when God does it, they redefine it as love. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You at your core and your heart, you are deceitful. Isaiah 64, 6, all of us have become like the one who is unclean. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. I remember writing this in my journal, that I was just a dirty rag, that I didn't deserve God's love. My entire childhood journal is like full of self-loathing. <laughs> it's just, I am a dirty rag. I am a bad person. I don't deserve love. Um, but that is 
what's instilled in the Christian within these, uh, you know, this theology. You're just so bad. You're not worthy, but you get it anyway. Lucky you. <laughs> as long as you obey, as long as you worship and do everything God says. Psalm 51, 5, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Isaiah 45, 9, woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but potsherds on the ground. Does the clay seize the potter? What are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? You are just pottery. You are just clay. You are broken pieces of clay on the ground. Who are you to ask questions? Who are you to have doubts? Who are you to talk back to your maker? This is very demeaning. Imagine if your spouse or your parent told you you're nothing but broken pottery on the floor. You're just a broken inanimate object and I can do whatever I want to you. Don't fight with me. Don't talk back to me. Don't argue with me. Don't disagree with me. <laughs> your feelings don't matter. That is very demeaning. That is very abusive. Another sign of an abusive relationship is that one controls the other. There's no equality in your relationship. One partner makes all of the decisions. God has all control over you, your birth, your life, your death, your destiny. He controls all things. No matter what you want to do, no matter what you plan to do, God is in control. God has the final say. He controls all. And anyone who is controlling everything in the relationship um, is, is probably doing some abusing there <laughs> um, because that's not the sign of a healthy relationship when one person has all of the authority, power, and control isolates others. Your partner restricts your contact with others. I, I think about uh, 2 Corinthians 6.14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Or I think about when Jesus says that, uh, I think it's uh, Luke 4.16, Luke, some, somewhere in Luke. Again, I'll look it up and I'll put it on the screen. In Luke, Jesus says, you, you must hate your mother. You must hate your father. You must hate yourself, hate your brother, hate everyone, hate everyone in your life in order to follow him and be his disciple. This is, uh, I, I know it's, uh, you know, hyperbolic speech. I know he's just kind of trying to make a point, but at the same time, there is this sense of isolation. Do not be yoked to unbelievers, separate yourself, hate everyone in order to follow me. Distance yourself from the world, from everything else and follow me. Even if that means giving up Every, everyone you love, everyone in your life. So there is this kind of isolation set apart. You must be set apart from the world, as they say. Uh, forces sexual activity or controls reproductive choices. Your partner forces or pressures you to engage in sexual activity you don't want to. Your partner controls your reproductive choices by sabotaging birth control or pressuring you to have or not have children. You must be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> you must have babies and do not get an abortion. Now, that's not really according to the Bible because the Bible has nothing to say about abortion, but ask most Christian leaders if you should get an abortion and they will tell you straight up, absolutely not. And, and so with that, I think that there is a major control in reproductive rights here and bodily autonomy that you do not, the, the message is that you do not own your body. God owns your body. When we look at all of this and we break it all down, uh, we see that Christianity, it's a religion. Y yeah, it is. When you claim it's not a religion, it's a relationship, it is. But both things can be true. It can be a religion and it can be a relationship. But then when you claim that it is a relationship, um, I think that that relationship must be defined. We see the definitions or the imagery that's used, a, a parent-child relationship, a groom and a bride relationship. Somehow these two things are the same. I don't understand it. I still have yet to have someone explain this to me and really make it make sense. I don't know if it's possible, um, but you know, you see a type of relationship, relationship imagery. But then when you look at what is a healthy relationship, what is an unhealthy relationship? What is an abusive relationship? Um, the relationship that Christians portray with their God through the Bible, through their theology, their apologetics, um, I don't think any of it falls within the bounds of a healthy relationship. I think most of it, all of it, falls within the definition of an unhealthy relationship. And I think it continues to fall under the definition of an abusive relationship. Um, and again, this is just my opinion. These are my thoughts. But if you really just think about it, if you consider your reality, if you consider what you know about the world, how you want to be treated, how you want to treat others, how people should be treating one another in relationships that are healthy, I, I don't know how 
a Christian can claim that their relationship with God is healthy when he is controlling, when he gives the silent treatment, when he demeans you, when he talks down to you, when he makes you feel as though you're not good enough, not worthy of love, when he controls every aspect of your relationship, every aspect of your life, what you do, what you don't do, how you feel and how you don't feel. It is, to me, it all boils down to control, control and oppression and coercion, because if you don't do it, if you don't obey, you are threatened with uh, very severe consequences to be separated from all that is good and light and, and joy and peace. And so I, th I think every Christian should really consider what is a relationship? What is a healthy relationship? And does my relationship with God look like a healthy relationship? And don't let them tell you, you can't compare your relationship to humans to your relationship with God, it's just so different when the Bible itself uses the imagery of relationships with human beings to compare to a relationship with God. It uses the relationship of a parent and a child. It uses the relationship of a bride and a bridegroom. Um, and so if the Bible is willing to use this metaphorical language to compare a human relationship with a relationship with God, then I I feel like I'm I'm well within my rights to do that, my biblical right to do that exact same thing. It's just that the Bible has really interesting ideas about what a healthy relationship looks like between a parent and a child, between a spouse and their spouse. And I think that's something to consider too. How does the Bible say that parents should treat their children? How does the Bible say that spouses should treat their spouses or how husbands should treat their wives. So I'm hoping that I gave you something to think about. I'm hoping that I at least gave you a perspective to consider and that you can kind of sort through this if you're questioning or you're doubting, you're trying to figure out what you believe, what's healthy, what's not. And, and you just kind of sit back and you really just kind of soak it all in. Think about it. Let your wheels turn. Don't feel like you need to come to a decision immediately, but let it just kind of sit there and see where it settles, how you feel about it. Thank you so much for watching. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you want to, you can subscribe to my channel so you can and ring the bell for notifications and you can see when I post new content. And, um, you know, the best way to support me is to like, leave a comment, engage in some way, share the video with your friends. Uh, those are all ways that you can help me and support this channel. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. <laughs>